All right, KISS Army, welcome to the KISS FAQ Podcast. Thank you for giving us your time today and letting us into your head. I hope we don't do any damage. This is a KISS-related podcast by the board for the board. We hope that you enjoy. Welcome to episode 251 of the KISS FAQ Podcast. I'm your host, Julian Gill. Today I'm joined by Marcus Almighty. Mark? Greetings, sir. 69th Blizzard, Ken. How's it going? And Mr. Happy. <laughs> that's right, Jack. That's right, Jack. And Woo! I'm on about two hours of sleep. Yep, I think Andy Moyen just punched My his computer screen. Gone away. <laughs> All right, so uh, congratulations, obviously, to St. Louis for their win of the Stanley Cup. Uh, you know, I was kind of surprised. I didn't know that it was still going on. It's like summertime, and they're still playing ice hockey. Uh, hockey in June is the best kind of hockey. Yeah, well, I guess it is when you win. Um, <laughs> what else? Well, I guess tonight we'll have the uh, t- Toronto Raptors and Golden State. Come so, on. fingers crossed. All right, that's enough of the sports headlines. Let's get into some KISS news. All right, what's going on this week in KISS land? Um, Decibel Geek, check out their episode. Uh, episode 363, New Noise. Apart from a whole bunch of uh, new music in there, Chris, uh, Chris, nice southern gentleman, Sinzak, um, is really too nice in dealing with the latest drama erupting out of Vinocchio. And I'll just leave it there. Go listen to the episode. Um, I would have let Aaron do all the talking because it would have been like a smackdown. And Chris is just too damn nice. Um, So thanks for the shout out, Chris. Obviously, I don't know how people get that information from these hidden boards and post it on the FAQ, but we appreciate you sharing news. And we'll just share this. Don't forget... The National Rockin' Pod is coming up in August. It is, when is it? It is August. Come on, I'm on the website, Chris. It's not instantly available. August the 9th and 10th at uh, <laughs> the airport in Nashville. A lot of good guests are going to be there. Uh, let's see. Jack Gibson from Exodus. Michael Sweet of Striper. Brian Forsyth from Kicks, Ari Vaughn from Danzig a whole lot of others and of course a lot of podcasts getting together to record live panels live shows meet with fans and record fans i will be there from our show recording got some good uh plans for what i'll be doing and taping there so hopefully get chris on soon and talk about the rock and pod and talk about him talk about kiss and let you know a little bit more about what i'll be doing there tickets get them now because it's going to be exciting that weekend um Though I think it'll only be the National Rock and Pod taking place that day. We'll have to wait and see. <laughs> Other kind of news is uh, these beauties are shipping and arriving. This is the new German. It's a splatter mm-hmm. vinyl. And I said I'd open this up on air if I remembered, and I did. So let me just cut my fingers off with my razor blade. And I want to see what this sucker looks like, so just bear with me one second. Because I need to use the friction method for one thing. All right. I must say the actual print and packaging looks fantastic. I have not compared it to a original, or a, actually the more common phonogram reissue of this album from 1980. So nice black dust sleeve. Oh, mm. one of the high quality ones. Mark approves of the poly lined yeah. card. Very good. And oh, nice. there is your sphincter wow. splatter. That's how you do it. That wow. is wow. definitely how you do it. And when you think back to <laughs> some of the complaints that have been coming in about the uh, the white marble KISS 45th anniversary edition, mm-hmm. um, you know what? I got lucky. I got a good one. And they've also changed it now to be black smoky uh, vinyl. So yeah, it's... yeah, you can actually... Uh, Oh, split seam. There's a bummer. Oh, there goes the value. Um, but like I said, on the other one, <laughs> the black smoky vinyl looks translucent. Looks very yeah. cool. I actually ordered one just because it looks cool. Waiting on, uh, what is it, double platinum to come in. But people have been posting images of that on Facebook. And it looks absolutely incredible. It's kind of liquidy silver looking from the uh, from the gray vinyl. 
They've uh, done the uh, sticker that was originally on the back of the the Mylar cover um, mm. as well. Right. But it, unfortunately, it's on the outside of the shrink. That's one kind of downer. I have to figure out how to cut that out and uh, put it in the package. And then, of course, it's got the award, I believe. But yeah. And yeah. the gatefold has photos, not uh, you know line drawing or whatnot. Maybe Australia can get into the act and do a reissue of the white la- or the white cover uh, with its line art. That would be in white vinyl. That would be awesome. Actually, that would be good. Ooh, yeah, yeah. Because yes, very cool. Okay. Many. Many. I was going to say many people would be probably wanting that not to happen though, because it would, you know, you know, people get very touchy about this Australian. Uh, version of it you know yeah, to it, keep it, their it value won't, it won't touch the the value of the original aster pressing you know that does have those covers because it'll be you know a shiny brand new one in white vinyl so and it won't have aster so i don't see it having any impact maybe tom has an opinion on that um but i i don't think it would i think it would just be something that people would love to add because they can't afford the uh you know the Aster version. You know it's exactly, like it's like yeah. collecting coins. You know if you collect yeah. U.S. Morgan dollars, the eighteen ninety five, you can't get. And so people buy a replica to put in that little hole. It's a space filler. So yeah, I'm yes. a coin collector, loser. Okay, let's get into today's episode. Um, it's around that time of year. Love Gun, anniversary. You know release date of that. Well. I don't want to set Kurt off. So I'm not going to say anything on when it was released. It was released in the second half or around the middle of June 1977. It may not have hit your store at exactly that time, but, uh, you know, whatever. I can't be bothered with the exact details. So we're going to talk about that one today. And, of course, you know, let's start off where we always do with your first encounters with a love gun. Mark. <laughs> <laughs> oh well uh my first encounter with the album let's uh start with that uh is uh uh i i think it was around the time actually that uh i encountered live too to be honest with you i wanted those early times when i was still living in the apartment building you know when i was younger uh and one of my sister's friends there ended up uh you know showing me the old alive too and then he he went on to explain to me that the tour for Alive 2 was for that record. And he ended up showing me, you know, the Love Gun album. And I was, you know, being like a young kid, you know, that, that album cover was like, wow, look at all those chicks, you know, like you were instantly taken by it, right? So uh, that was really my first uh, experience of it was when I was exposed to the whole Alive 2 situation and checking that out. They kind of showed me that album at the same time. And he uh, ended up playing it for me as well. And uh, yeah, I I immediately took to it, actually. that That's one record that's actually sat very well with me throughout the years. Nice. Lonnie, what about you as, I guess, representing the younger age, age group of the kind of fans? When did it first come into your path? The younger age. Um, <laughs> I got it on audio cassette in the mid 80s i'm getting yeah mid 80s i was it was one of my first albums that i had my brother had destroyer on cassette and creatures in the night on cassette and i got love gun was the first album i had and i still have that audio cassette and i wore it out mm-hmm. like i mean for you know you guys, you guys know you guys yeah. just wear out audio cassettes because i played it so damn much um, I loved it and still do. It's, it's, it's very, it's a very special album to me because of that. Cause it's the first one I, I really ever owned. Or, was that or animalized? I don't, I don't know. It was one of the two. I had them both on cassette. It was right around the same time. Maybe I got them both at the same time. For that matter. Um, but I always loved it. And, um, you know, so, you know, Growing up in the eighties, what did you do? If you're if you had a cassette of, of one and your brother had a cassette of something else, you know you 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 know you made a copy for your brother and he you know he made a copy for you. And, you know, just because. So it's it's a it's a very special album to me for that reason. 
Nice. I think that's probably the same for me. Mid eighties, obviously, when I first got into the band and started going back through the catalog, I don't remember when I got this. So I'm just figuring that because I went by covers and which albums, you know, had the the most songs on it, I probably picked this one up pretty soon after getting in because that cover, you know, would have grabbed my attention like hotter than hell did. So I do remember playing the living shit out of that cassette, um, and it became a favorite you know, quite easily for me as as a new fan because there was something, you know, the production. Um, I've always kind of said this, that I, I see it as a sister album in terms of the production qualities to uh, Crazy Nights in that it's highly mm. polished, very kind of refined and made friendly, especially after Rock and Roll Over and the raw, rough edge to that. So um, it's kind of a sonic sibling from across the decade um to that album for me for my ears and everyone processes sound differently so uh i'm wrong if you think i'm wrong mm -hmm. um so that that's all i remember and i just remember you know I'll, i guess i'll talk more about the songs when we start getting into the list but ken uh, you got into the band in that era that alive Two mm -hmm. was your first album so this was that was the album <coughs> for which this was the tour so yeah so i remember getting Alive 2 and Double Platinum and the solo albums. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking I did get Love Gun. Uh, it been the first regular album that I got um, from their catalog. Um, so, and that probably was either 77, 78, probably, 70, probably 78 actually. Um, and I, when I started buying them and one of the reasons I probably picked that one was because, you know, I liked Off Alive 2. My initial favorites were the Gene songs were, you know, uh, Calling Dr. Love and Christine 16. Uh, so I kind of ventured towards those albums that had that at first and then kind of worked my way um, around or back. Um, so, yeah, I got that pretty early. I remember it, playing it. I remember... Uh, Thinking it was a pretty darn good album. I thought what was weird to me was when the first time I heard, you know, Ace sing. Um, I just thought that was kind of strange to me. I thought, oh, this that's a different kind of voice, you know. It's kind of weird. Uh, and I don't think I liked that song back when I first got it. But then later on, I, I you know, became a fan of it much, much more uh, over the years. So, But, yeah, great album. I still have the Love Gun uh popper thing that i put together when <laughs> that came out of the album um so it's always you know great packaging from kiss back then yeah a really good cover you know that whole thing everything that you could get in there had a merch order form was that the sign yeah. of blood at the first uh kiss comic as well was coming out at the same time um the labels uh, obviously were the first ones to fe feature a band print on the center ring design um you know, and then finding copies that don't have that are kind of like the more desirable ones to find these days. So, mm -hmm. singles. First single issued off the album was Christine 16, backed with Aces Shock Me. And then, of course, Love Gun and Hooligan came out. So all four songwriters and singers were represented on the two singles. And in uh, some countries like Australia and the United Kingdom, Then She Kissed Me was issued as a single. So, God help us. Um, what are your thoughts on the singles, Ken? Christine 16, good first choice. Would you have done something else to kind of lead off the album? Uh, no, I think that's an obvious choice for the first single uh, when you're thinking about AM radio at the time. Um, I I just don't see much. I mean, yeah, Love Gun was the second one, but Christine 16 as the first one made sense to me. It's kind of a little catchy tune. It's not heavy, you know, it has the piano and stuff in it. Um, so I think it was a good choice. I, I would have went with that one first. Yeah, because there's nothing more than you want to hear on the radio than when I see you coming out of school one day. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, Lonnie, what are your thoughts on those singles? Um, I don't if... have a problem with Christine 16 being the lead single either. I mean, it makes sense. It's catchy. Like, I mean, you got to remember Neil Bogart is you know, very heavily involved still. And, you know, it's totally a Neil Bogart song. You know, it's a catchy type of song. You can almost hear Christine 16 on Trust to Kill, where they're really, you yeah, know, yeah. we're really focused on a lot of catchy 
song is really looking for a single. So I think it makes sense that that's why they chose it to be the lead single. I mean, you could sit here and say, well, I Still Your Love is the best song on the album. It should have been the lead single. But, and, and, and maybe you would have a point to that, but I think Christine 16 actually makes the most sense from a business standpoint, though. Yeah, I'll agree with that. You know, in terms of crossover appeal, it's rocking enough and friendly enough, as Ken said for AM radio. Mark, what's your take on those? Yeah, I I agree too. I mean, it's one of those rare times. I think we talked about this not long ago. This is one of those surprising times when Gene did have a single first, right? He was the lead off man. Surprise, surprise. But uh, yeah, I think it was a smart idea. I agree with Lonnie. I mean. You know, Mr. Bogart is a smart man. He made his career on this kind of bubblegum sort of approach with singles. So he probably knew instinctively what to probably take on it. And it had that kind of flair to it with the piano and stuff like that going on in it. You know, it's it, like you guys said, it was heavy enough to kind of still keep the regular fans appeased. But, you know, it was softer enough and catchier enough to maybe bring in some new fans, maybe bring in some, you know, more female audience people into it too, right? Uh, but, yeah, I think it's a, I think it's a decent single. I mean, you know, like I said, it wouldn't be, it wouldn't be my first choice, but I think it's the smart choice. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, I don't have a problem with that one at all. But I just wonder, for anyone who's a fan in 1977, did you actually ever hear Love Gun on the radio when that one came out as a single? Because that just does not strike me as a good mm -hmm. choice, that it should have been something like Shock Me um, if they were you know, going to put Gene as the first single then why don't you put the voice that you've never heard before out there as a single, especially, you know, well, there's a certain amount of payola, you know, corrupts everything sure. when we talk about Kiss singles. But I've also wondered, uh, you know, with Then She Kissed Me getting issued in the UK and Australia, I'm wondering if it was ever their plan to release that first until Sean Cassidy had his number one with... A remake oh, yeah. of a you know a '60s girl group. You know he did uh, what was it? The Do Run Run. The Do Run Run. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, run, which run, went run, to number run. one. You know, and were they thinking? You know, was yeah. there talk in the industry around the time that Sean was going to do that song? So Kiss jumped on with Then She Kissed Me. I don't think I've ever had what I think is an acceptable explanation of how that song ended up, uh, you know, being recorded. Uh, it mm -hmm. just there some, seems to be something lacking in that explanation to me um, in the official KISS book. So that's, you know, one of those things. It's like, well, Sean had a hit. Were they planning it? Because it did still turn up as a single in a couple of markets, which strikes me as very odd. Or did it just turn up there because they thought, you know, those were prime targets for that sort of material in 1977. So, you know, that there's a nice 12-inch you can collect for the UK version and the Australian 7-inch, I think, uh, is, is backed with almost human so, you know, it's very collectible, mm -hmm. or at least was back way back when I was collecting singles. So, uh, you know, Christine 16, fine, good choice, you know, no worse than anything else that could have been picked. But I think the second one, Love Gun, was never going to shock. It just wasn't going to get played any more than Kiss didn't already get played if you go by what's been said about them. So they should have done something that was more likely to get played, like here's Ace Frehley singing, uh, you know, hell, mm -hmm. shock everyone. I always hear two pack in my ears saying, let's shock the people. Um, right. <laughs> so let's get into our usual ranking, of course, is based on the one of the few methodologies that we can come up with, and that's by stealing it from the lipstick panel. So thanks, Greg and Steve. Um, I still haven't figured out a better way to skin this cat, so we're going to keep using theirs. We've all ranked our preferences of the tracks in order and assigned a point value to each added them up at the end and in number 10 10th place um <laughs> yeah you're not no guesses are allowed because it's just so obvious then she <laughs> kissed me so i've given you the history and the thoughts on that i hated this song the time first time i heard it i am still not a big fan of it though i appreciate music a little bit more so i've experienced more of that era of music and it's nice and they do it well it's recorded nicely but it shouldn't be on a freaking kiss album mark what's your thoughts on then she kissed me um i never liked it either mainly because of the fact that my parents had the original version of it on vinyl and they used to play it a lot. 
in the house, especially on the weekends. You know, they'd mm. crank up the stereo and it's like, oh, no, here we go with the 50s music again. And if, sure enough, that would come on, that song. And I remember when I first heard it on the Love Gun record, I used to bug the hell out of my sister about it because I used to go, hey, wait a minute, isn't this supposed to be? And then he kissed me. That sounds kind of gay. You know, I, I was so young then, you know, I was kind of bugging him. Like, why is he singing about a guy kissing him? And she's like, she's, he's not singing that. It's, they changed it. You know, so I used to always bug her and say, no, no, I think he made him, you know, he was originally thinking that or whatever, just to bug her. I would used to bring that up. But it's it just the song itself really bothered me because of the fact that it was a song that my parents liked. So, of course, when you're young, it instantly makes it not cool, right, to me. So... I just never, it never clicked into me. Even years later now, it's, I never ever get to that point in the record. I just take it off when Plaster Caster's done and that's it. Yeah, that's kind of a tough one when you've heard the same song before uh, in a different <laughs> context. Ken, what about you? Yeah, this this was my least favorite. Um, the, the big question is, yeah, like you were saying, Julian, why, why did they go with this song? Um, the only thing I could think of is at the time there was things like, uh, you know, that that do run around thing and uh, some other artists were doing older songs, you know, making them new again kind of thing. There was a few artists out there doing it. It was kind of a thing at the time. You had the happy days TV show, you know, rock around the clock was became actually a hit. Um, so things like that, um, where it's like what is what old what is old is new now kind of thing that kind of thing so i think that's why uh it was kind of their attempt to kind of get on the bandwagon again probably a, a day day late and a dollar short or whatever you want to say <laughs> it's they're always they're always behind the the uh trend they're not leading the trend they're just kind of following that trend and they're always a little a little bit too late and that song is it doesn't make any sense on the cassette then at least they weren't as late as aerosmith who covered uh what was it remember walking remember the sand yeah on, yeah, on, yeah. On, that uh, was night, night in the ruts which i actually love always loved that song that was uh, one of my first girlfriend's yeah, okay. favorite songs so uh, always reminds me of her lonnie then she kissed me and by the way that yeah. scored four points so all of us had it as bottom pick you can't <laughs> you cannot do That's any a worse on a on a four-person panel than four points no um <laughs> it it's not good it shouldn't it shouldn't be it shouldn't be on there they should have stopped at nine songs or they should have found you know something else even like that that reputation that they put out on the love gun deluxe you just put put any anything would have been better than that yeah so i i'm, I'm kind of in the same camp as mark where um you know, I, like I said, I got down in the '80s when I was when I was a kid, and you know, obviously your your parents drive you around when when you're a kid because you can't drive yourself. And mom would always listen to oldies music in, in the car, 103.3 KLU oldies all the time. It's like, oh my god, stop! <laughs> and this song would come on quite a bit. And then I got the Kiss album, and I was just like. Oh, I hate this. This is like the stupid song. It's always on in the car with my mom. Why is this? This is terrible. So like, it it's never resonated with me. It's it's always had like that stigma to it. Very similar to Mark. It's always had that stigma to it. Oh, it's stupid. Why? I don't I don't I don't understand it. I never have and probably never will. Well. You're not hiding your feelings for no. that one in any way. I mean, Mark, I if think... If commenters say they like the blunt lines, I'm just going to be blunt. <laughs> you know, some of the stuff that was on the deluxe edition would have made more sense if it actually existed in 1977 because it just, all that Ooh. stuff seems to have just been thrown on there, you know, much too soon. Um, mm -hmm. I know who you are, um, you know, who knows? doesn't matter. And maybe, you know, everyone's probably, or many people have seen that uh mock-up of the back cover which had the different song title listed in place of then she kissed me oh, yeah. which was see you baby so you know that's another question out there of what exactly is that was that another song that was intended because i know they were running behind schedule and in getting into the studio there was you know changes to all the plans and then it was you know done in quite a fast clip so you know 
Uh, there's not a mm. book in the Love Gun story, but there are, I think there would be some good interviews. I mean, if Corky's notes had all been destroyed in the hurricane and the band would actually, uh, you know, Peter and Ace talk about that, there would be some maybe some interesting stories. Probably not, but there we go. All right, let's move on into ninth place on 13 points. So that's already a pretty big jump up from the bottom of the barrel tomorrow and tonight. And I'm going to put my hands up here. I, This is my second from bottom pick. But back in the day, in the 80s, when I was first listening to this, my head bopped around while listening to this one repeatedly. Uh, you know, I, I still won't skip it. So even though it's in ninth position for me, it's just that it has to, something has to be down at the bottom of my list. That's just the way it works. It's physics. Um, and this one is just too derivative. And Ken, let's start with you and your thoughts on tomorrow and tonight. Yeah, that one, uh, what I, my note, I wrote uh, rock and roll all night over or something like that. Um, it's, it's just a, a obvious attempt by Paul to write another rock and roll all night. And, and it's, it was already done. And uh, it's, it's a good attempt, you know, uh, but it's, it's not a, a, a great song that I want to, you know, play it over and over again. Um, it's just kind of, uh, I don't know, it's tr it's tr to me it's just trying too hard, just trying too hard to, to be rock and roll night, uh, another anthem. Um, he can write other anthems, but he doesn't need to copy his own anthem that <laughs> he already did. Just try to go, think outside the box a little bit more. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's, it's okay, it just doesn't, it's it's maybe one song I would I would skip, you know, on this. Now, as a Kiss fan, original Kiss fan, we always bow down to you as an elder, mm -hmm. uh, since <laughs> us mid '80s people are not worthy to breathe the same air. Orpheus. Um, now, what maybe. did you think about the background vocalists? Stop. You know, this is the one of the songs of the Kissettes, very prominent on it. I mean, when you first heard this album and you've oh. got these high female voices, yeah. I mean, obviously one we now know was the cop from the village people, Ray Simpson, <laughs> Tasha Thompson, right. Hilda, what the, Hilda, uh, Harris. Okay. So Ruben Hilda Hilda? Harris. <laughs> oh, more. No, you know, what did you, what did you think about that? Because they're on a couple of tracks throughout the album where those vocals really become prominent. Do change the musical dynamics of the kisses sound? Yeah, I thought that was interesting. To me, I just thought uh, at the time is, uh, you know, why are they having female back background singers on this? I mean, I, I don't hear it on anything else. Um, they should just do the background singer, you know, group vocals, uh, gang vocals uh, themselves. It just didn't make sense. I don't know what they were going for there. Um, unless it was some kind of Motown-y kind of thing or which, you know, Let's face it, Paul likes Motown, um, <laughs> but maybe that's that was part of the thinking at the time. Um, but yeah, I, I didn't think that was needed. I, I would have rather than done their own backgrounds. Lonnie, tomorrow and tonight. I agree with Ken wholeheartedly that it's them trying too hard to write rock and roll night again. You're trying to copy yourself and not it's it's not being original you know it's like you know a comedian who comes up with a good joke and tries like just rewriting like the same type of joke over and over and over again you know and and that's really kind of what they're doing here with that they had you know they had success with rock and roll night they had moderate success with we shout it out loud you know and it's like oh well we we have to write this this rock anthem party rock anthem again and by this point, you know, they're, they're running on fumes in, in that category. And it just, it's, it's a good song. Don't get me wrong. Like you said, Julian, I, I don't skip it when I, when I, when I play the disc or the record, I don't, I don't skip it. And, but something has to be second to last. And, and this is just an effort of them trying too hard to do something that they've already have done. So it's, it, it just doesn't, it just doesn't resonate for me at all. Nope. Fair enough. Uh, Mark. Yeah. Well, I had this up quite a bit higher than you guys. I had this like at number four. Um, I don't mind this song, 
I found that over the years that the more I listen to it, the more I just find that it's just a straight ahead kind of fun song. The the female backing vocals don't really bother me, to be honest. Um, but then again, the dynamic is a bit different too. Like, like, you know, with Ken, he was in that golden period and was expecting a certain sound from them. And so when something like this comes up, you know, it probably was a jolt to the system. For me, you know, it, I didn't have that sort of expectation when I heard this record. Everything was very new to me. How did I know that they didn't do this before on a prior record, right? So um, I agree that they tried to write an anthem style song again. To me, I don't hear rock and roll all night so much in this. I hear more shouted out loud to me that in the approach of how they wrote it. Uh, but it's the idea is there, you know, rock and roll night shout it out loud those are all kind of anthemic songs that are meant to you know get people out of their seat and you know going nuts and boogieing or whatever right so um it's it's not a bad song to me i mean to me there are considerably weaker songs than that on there but that's just my opinion you guys won't agree i'm sure i'm sure ken was very shocked at my list when i posted it earlier so um but you know there's just some songs that i think are you know marketably worse than this song i think it's not bad you know i'm not surprised that i'm actually surprised that they didn't use this as a single yeah that that is very surprising in some ways so all right so the backing vocalists are proof that paul was a fan of r&b before he did soul station okay that's good to know all right let's move on on 14 points we have a tie i gotta do a tiebreaker so um we'll do almost human first (laughs) <laughs> and that hurts because that's a pretty cool song. But again, you know, if if something has to be down near the bottom, it has to be down <clears> near <throat> the bottom. I would love to have heard the Kiss recording of this live, as I oh, I think it was this one that may be the, the Phantom song that was only done at the first show in Halifax on that tour. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it's a cool, evil song, but it's also just kind of a decline. You had the God of Thunder standard, and then everything else that was a weak. Um, facsimile of that it was trying to fit in and you you really never get Gene back in that mode again until Unholy and then he's back full blast as evil Gene so it's okay as a song it's not great love the demo um, hope that's one they evolved and not something else I've just mentioned uh, there you go Ken almost human yeah I had this at uh six on my list i've always liked the song i always thought it was kind of cool uh different song from gene and i thought it was kind of i liked the music the way it was kind of a eerie type you know uh music in in the song and even it reminded me of like uh kind of a horror movie kind of thing um kind of like it, it made me think of like mummies egyptian type thing uh just that that riff that they had at the beginning of the song, I thought was really cool. Um, the bass playing in the song is really cool. There's some cool uh, licks that um, Gene does th- in the song. If you really listen you know, um, to some of it, you know, throughout the whole song, there's some really things, you know, running, running uh, bass lines he does that are pretty cool. Um, but and the solo is really strange. <laughs> I mean, it's just a strange. Uh, probably a combination of sounds that they try to do they got from ace and and just kind of mesh them together to make it sound you know and it fit fit the song it just worked so i've always liked the song it's always been a kind of a favorite of mine um from gene and it's you know it's not your typical again it's i don't think it's a typical gene song either now whenever i see the mummies in the phantom of the park i'm always going to hear this song in my head there you go. <laughs> There's always a debate though whether it's you know. funny though, they've they've always had a debate about whether that's actually Ace doing the guitar solo in this song. We don't know. It could be Gene even. Yeah, we that's what know. they were kind of thinking. It was just Gene making a lot of ruckus kind of yeah, that could be solo. It. Yeah, who knows? So give us your thoughts on it, Mark. Well, I had this second last on my list. Um I I don't know. I, I never really liked the song, and I have a bad feeling that it had to do with being influenced again by my older sister's friends because I distinctly remember when they were playing this song, 
at the apartment in that guy's house. This song almost caused a a, a scrap in this guy's mm-hmm. house because when I was sitting there, you know, a young guy and these older guys in there, you know, with their jean jackets and all that. And all of a sudden this one guy comes into the room and this song had started playing. And the one guy looked at him and goes, Hey, who switched the kiss and put on Santana? And he's like, what are you, hey, what are you talking about? He goes, who, what's with the bongo drums, man? The congas, what is this, a Santana <laughs> album or something? And then it just erupted from there into some huge, like, brouhaha about you know how santana sucks and th- this is kiss and you know it, it just it, it escalated from there and i don't know if that maybe subconsciously was in the back of my mind that it's not hip to like this song because you know the older cool kids you know thought that it really sucked right but um i don't know it's just i think it's more a situation with me where i just don't think it's gene's strongest writing um it's not terrible but that's the problem with a record like this. I think there's a lot of good stuff on here. And like you guys say, that there has to be something that has to be near the bottom, right? And the other songs have to be higher if, if you look at it from that manner, right? Yeah, that's what it's all about. And you could have said, hey, man, what's wrong with the congas? That's Jimmy <laughs> May Lin on congas, man. That's just not anyone. <laughs> what's uh, wrong with you? <laughs> yeah. You know up, him? up yours, you freaky freak. All right, Lottie. <laughs> Um, I had this third from bottom, not real high, obviously, but like you guys said, unfortunately, you know, it's it's one of the classic six Kiss albums. Well, something has to be near the bottom. I mean, we we love the classic six Kiss albums. That's you know one of the reasons why, probably one of the bigger reasons why we're Kiss fans with those six original studio albums. So, unfortunately, something has to be near the bottom, and almost human is almost at the bottom for me. It's a great song. Don't get me wrong. I would, I like it when um, Gene came here on his solo tour and they did Almost Human. I thought it was one of the coolest things I'd you know ever seen. I mean, I walked out of that show thinking, man, that was that's more fun than some of the Kiss shows I've seen recently with them playing that set list that they played. So it's it's a, it's a good song. I I and I like I agree with with Ken. You know that it's you know kind of a, a demonic type, God of Thunder type feel to it obviously and it's it's but unfortunately it's, it's good but unfortunately it's just ranked number eight out of ten for me because you know it's on the same album as love gun i started love and shot me so i mean it has the it has the something has to take the fall unfortunately yeah it's got some so, stiff competition on the album right it's official now that we have to rename that song from almost human to almost at the bottom so that's, that's a new <laughs> That's a new song title for that. All right, and tied on 14 points with that was Hooligan, and I gave Peter the Bronx nod. Uh, that would be the Brooklyn nod for Peter, obviously, but uh, after hearing him do that in New York City with uh, mm. brass on it, and, you know, it's just so much fun. You know, it's stupid, but that it's it embodies what a Kiss song should be. I mean, 35 Chevy on a whatever frame. Dropped out <laughs> right. of, can't even spell <laughs> right. my name. Dropped out of school when I was 22. Black sheep. Mama says I was a creep. You know, and it's really the first oh, yeah. uh, kind of song I think Stan said that they had collaborated on actively in the studio. So that, you know, they'd sit around together a lot writing and bouncing ideas and coming up with things. But this was one that was pretty much written then and there. Um, and it, it's just a cool biographical song, but until you've heard it and seen Peter playing it with, uh, you know, full brass accompaniment, I think he did that with Ace at the Eddie Trunk thing uh, as well um, a year or two before that. So, you know, it's a cool song, and it actually made it into the set. So, you know, we're now firmly into yeah. the middle of the, the rankings. So, again, it's all good songs, really. It's just some very tough comp- uh, competition on this album. Mark, straight back to you for Hooligan. Um, yeah, I mean, I had this ranked eighth. Um, I-, I think it's more higher than, let's say, Almost Human for me, because I think I find it, it's kind of like a, a fun song. You know, it, it when I hear it, I believe it's a Peter song. You know what I mean? It, it has that kind of stigma to it when I hear it. And uh you know, it's not overly complicated. It's pretty much like one part throughout the song, right? They just shifted here and there just for something, uh, for a chorus or something like that. But, uh, you know, lyrically, you know, it's humorous, just how uh, 
you know, on well written it is but that's i think part of the fun of it i think that it's kind of that has that kind of you know peter chris feel to it and you know i kind of liked it because i always liked peter's voice and i think what kind of made me also take to it more was one of my first bootleg concert videos i ever got when i went to these kiss conventions i got my vhs uh video of the love gun tour and you know when paul goes we're going to do Hooligan, you know, and then they come and play it. I was like, wow, they're doing Hooligan. And I always thought it was kind of cool because, you know, he had the double neck guitar then out for that. And I was like, wow, this is actually cooler than I thought it was because on album, you know, you don't have that kind of visual of them, you know, seeing Paul running around with a double neck guitar and, you know, Peter behind the kit singing it. And, and it kind of bumped up my love liking of that song uh, because of that whole image in my mind when I think of this song. So, yeah, it's not, a, it's not a bad song. It's, it's Peter, you know? Yeah, well, last night there were probably more than a few hooligans in St. Lou. Woo! Wow. <laughs> um, it's uh, it's what is it? It's sixth on my list. I I like hooligan. Um, it's you know it's definitely a, a Peter Chris. You can definitely like like Mark said. Like even before Peter starts singing, you can almost you can almost tell first time you listen to it if you put yourself in that that mode or perspective that it that it's the peter song it, it just has peter's feel to it um i really like it i i remember like being in like sixth or seventh grade and like and like singing it and my friends are like well, dropped out of school when you were 22 what what, what are you singing like that's <laughs> you know you know um i was like oh no, it's, it's great you know my friends are like, what kisses you know kiss on that's 12 13 years old or whatever it was at the time you know they're they not familiar with that obviously so i was you know unique in that you know, not my friends like kiss and it's old in their opinion you know so but i liked hooligan and i and i still do it and i remember listening to it and my brother would be like you know this is and we didn't know much. We were kids, you know. Just I like this is this is one of Kiss's bigger songs. He's telling me when we were kids, you know. I'm like, no, oh, okay. You know, I don't I don't know any better. He doesn't, you know. He just thinks he knows what he's talking about. So, I I grew up thinking this is like a a, a big hit for them. And I was, well, why isn't it on any of the greatest hits? Then, and then I kind of figured out that well, maybe he really doesn't know what he's talking about. So, <laughs> um, but I I like it. It's, it's you know it's middle of the, middle of the road, but again, stiff stiff competition on the album. Yep, and you've ranked it the highest out of us. So, Ken, yeah. you, me, and Mark, were all had it third from bottom. Yeah, it's always kind of been low for me. Uh, I mean, it's it's well sung. It's a great vocal by Peter, as usual. Um, but like Mark says, it really doesn't go anywhere. It's kind of it's the same thing over and over again. Um yeah, I thought it was kind of strange, the lyrics, <laughs> some of the lyrics in that. Uh, though I do agree that the, the live version, it works much better uh, or much more fun than the studio version. I think it's just, uh, you know, again, I keep saying it over and over, these songs come, to, come alive. Um, but, uh, yeah, it's just not a song that's one of his better written songs, um, you know, Dirty Living is much better than, you know, this song, uh, in my opinion, much, much better. Um, so, uh, it, but again, it's it's okay. And I, I won't skip it, but it's just an okay song. Yeah, I don't think any of us skip it. All right, so rounding out the f bottom half of Love Gun in sixth place on 18 points, and obviously the bottom half is everything under 20 points, Got Love for Sale, which that's like a knife in the heart. I love that song. Um, and that was one of the ones I loved seeing Gene's band do. And you know, mm. again, it was one that Kiss rehearsed for the Love Gun tour. Or what was it? The Can-Am tour, 77, whatever they called it. So 18 points. Got Love for Sale. The uh, best of the Van Halen Brother demos as well, in my opinion, on Gene's vault in terms of mm. the guitar work was actually something where Eddie was allowed to be Eddie, and unlike mm -hmm. Christine 16, where he was pigeonholed into doing something very specific. 
um, Got Love for Sale was really cool, and that was that actually made the Van Halen demos worth it after all the fuss about them over the years for me. Um, Ken, your thoughts on Got Love for Sale? Yeah, well, my notes, I put, uh, I put Got Love Gun for Sale. Um, but yeah, it's this song goes up and down in my rankings. Uh, sometimes I like it a lot. I, I don't know if I have to be in the mood for it uh, more than other times. Um, like today, I listened to it this morning, and that's why that's where it fell. I mean, that's just where it fell. Sometimes I'd rank that one higher than maybe uh, you know almost human or or whatever or Christian sixteen. It's just it just fell there. Um, on my list, I mean, it's seven. It's not too bad, um, but it falls under some of these other stellar songs. So something's gotta gotta give. Um, but yeah, it's a cool song. I, like I, I saw that video of the Gene Simmons band doing the song, and it yeah, it's it's very cool there. And, you know, I like seeing it done live. So um, good song. It just falls where it falls. You know. Yeah, typical Gene stealing cool song titles and bits from bands like this was a song by the Sonics. Have tra- uh, whatever. There's yeah. also Have Gun, Will Travel. Have Kendra, Will Travel. And Have Love, Will Travel was the oh, course right. of Have Love Gun, Will Travel. That's what I was saying. That's right. Have Love, Will Travel. <laughs> um, Lonnie, got love for sale. Um, I have it 7 out of 10. I like it. Um, It's a catchy Gene song. Whoosh. Again, you know, Christine 16, it, when we talk about that, it's a catchy Gene song, too. There's not a whole lot of catchy Gene songs, if you stop and really think about it, you know. But, but there's, there's, you know, there's two of them on, on this album. And I was excited when I, I got to see the Gene Simmons band do it. Um, you know, it's right there with, with Almost Human. I was like, oh, wow, you know, they're going to play that. It's, it's fine. But it's it's further down on my list, but but it is catching and it's good and it, I go. I would have liked to see Kiss do it, you know. They said they they rehearse it for the first part of the for, for the Love Gun tour. It would have been interesting to see, you know, Kiss Kiss's interpretation of the song live. But you know, it's it's a good song. It just unfortunately again, it's on the same album as some really great songs so it's close, it's closer to the bottom for me i mean it's kind of tough to write catchy happy lyrics when you're singing about logs and fireplaces for sure and <laughs> hot dives through butters and right. all bullies. I mean, but it's just, but, so this well, is about then, as this is so about then, as then, pop as gene gets it's a poppy as it's as pop as gene gets i mean it's, it's kind of rare that, you know and there are two poppy type gene songs on the same record so yeah he's right. not singing about logs really? and fireplaces and well, he is kind of have love will travel. Well, he is, but not in... He's going to deliver the log <laughs> to wherever your fire is burning. <laughs> yeah. That's correct. All right, Mark, have love will travel. I mean, got love for sale. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Well, I kind of I kind of like this song. I have it uh, at seven. I think me and Lonnie's uh, lists are kind of mirroring each other this week. Uh, I, I think what I liked about it initially was I thought the, the, the guitar riff is pretty pretty cool you know it's just pretty simple at dan, 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 dan. It's, it's kind of caught me the first time i ever heard that like, yeah that's pretty cool and that's one thing that gene you know you can knock him for a lot of his kind of songwriting but every once in a while he'll come up with one of these kind of riffs that kind of just grab you but they're really you know real simple based around a or something like that and it's you know it's one of those examples where he kind of caught a good riff I just wish that the lyrics would have been up to the standard of the music. I think that they're, you know, not his best lyrics, but like we just said that earlier, like Gene has a style of writing lyrics. That's all his own. That's for sure. You can't mistaken a, a Gene written song lyrically and think that that's like Peter or somebody, you know? So um, it, it's not a bad song. I, I really like it. And uh, I'm glad that it's in where it is on the album. I mean, it's pretty early on in the, you know, on the side A there, and I think it deserves to be there. It's it's a pretty catchy song. Yeah. All right, so we're into the top half now, and I guess any of these songs, you know, are well over 20 points each, um, are all winners. So uh, 
in fifth place on 23 points, Christine 16. I always like the piano. I mean, it just introduced a different vibe into this. You hadn't really, I guess if you'd been a fan of Kiss in 74, you would have been, you know, where's the piano <clears> on? <throat> and you don't really hear it on Destroyer because it's buried in the mix. You heard it a little bit on Nothing to Lose. And then here it comes back on this album, Full Force, uh, on a couple of tracks. And Christine 16 is just a good fun mid-70s stupid poppy rock song and you know we kind of summed it up pretty well uh when we're talking about the singles ken anything to add on that no christine 16 was a great song i mean i've always loved the song um since i first heard it i always liked it um again for its catchiness and i I don't know. I was listening to like a lot of catchy stuff back at that time, so it just fit in with a lot of other stuff. Um, one thing I'll point out when we were talking about the guitars uh, sound on this, um, I think Eddie Kramer did tone them down to kind of go with the guitar sounds of the time period. I mean, uh, what's a similar guitar sound out there at the time was like, if you look at uh, Foreigner's first album in 77, similar similar tones um that they had and i think it could be a sign of the times of what they were trying to you know fit into at the time with their songs so anyway creatures i mean not creature but uh, christy 60 was a great was a great uh great song i always liked it. and they weren't the you know what's interesting toning themselves down if you listen to aerosmith draw the line which was recorded right before mm -hmm. this was recorded, um, you know, also toned down its sound and its sonics as well as they, I guess, a wider commercial appeal. Mark, your thoughts. I was just going to say that it's funny because I read somewhere too that there was a running rumor that on these songs that it was more uh, Eddie Kramer worked on Peter's and Ace's songs more and that Paul and Gene kind of wanted more control of their own songs. So if that mm -hmm. is true... Maybe it was something that Gene thought would, you know, maybe help out, you know, get, getting a song into more top 10 kind of category, you know, with having it a little leaner on the guitars there. Um, but I, I don't mind Christine 16. I mean, I've always thought that the beginning of the song was actually kind of interesting and something that if you watch them perform this live uh, was always funny to watch Peter because that intro with that dun dun. And then the first time the drums come in, he's on the offbeat. <laughs> and then they switch it back to on the beat. And you always watch Peter and he always kind of seems like he's like, am I going to get it right? He's like almost like struggling to get it correct in that time. And then when they go into the normal time, he just rocks it no problem. But I always thought that was kind of interesting that Gene thought of the introduction like that to make it offbeat and on, on beat. So, you know, it's kind of interesting little writing dynamic that he threw into the song but you know the piano i don't mind it i'm not really hit big on the piano stuff with kiss uh but you know it, it's it's okay for the song it kind of added to that kind of uh you know commercialability to it and i thought that the chorus was really good i thought that the the harmonized singing in the chorus was really catchy excellent lonnie i wasn't a big fan of the yeah. piano on it either when, when I first heard it, it's like, oh, there's supposed to be Kiss. You know, why is there, why is there piano in this song, you know? <laughs> and so just to tap off what you guys are just talking about, but I like the song. I always, I always really have. I, I always thought it was a, you know, a, a fun song, especially when you're a kid, you know, you hear a song about Christine 16, you know, you think that's fun. And actually, when I was in senior in high school, my buddy Matt, was dating a girl named Christine, and she was 16 at the time. And I told him that is the coolest thing ever. And he's like, "What are you talking about?" I go, "I go, I go, your girlfriend." I go, "I go, I go, how old is Christine?" He goes, "16." And I go, "I go, that is so cool." And he goes, "Why?" <laughs> I was like, "You don't even know. You don't even know, dude." So I always remember. I always remember that. And when I. I was really happy when they when they brought the song back in 04 and they played it on the Rock the Nation tour, you know, and they mixed up the set list actually and, and played Christine 16 on that tour. I thought it was really cool and a lot of fun. And there was rumor that they were going to play Christine 16, like before the tour even started. And I told my girlfriend at the time, you know, they're going to play Christine 16, Christine 16. And she goes, and I said, I, said, I don't think they're going to play that. They're, you know, Kiss is you know, a little bit older. It might be a little creepy them 
singing Christine 16 at this point in their career. And she goes, well, they never should have wrote the song anyway because it's perverted. <laughs> <Jesus> <laughs> <Christ>. <laughs> I didn't take her much longer after that. <laughs> yeah. Oh, okay, well, here's a... obviously, obviously, you and I are not connecting. <laughs> no. So, something wrong here. All right, so this is another song that was brought back. This one was brought back in uh, 2015 into the set. It had been done on the Unplugged tour and album, if I'm not mistaken. Fourth place on 27 points, Plastercaster. And, of course, Gene never had anything to do with Cynthia Plastercaster. Um, it was wishful thinking and more singing about hearing about that rather than suggesting otherwise though she took him to task i believe um cool song very cool that um when it's been in the set you know great on the unplugged tour as an unusual deep cut so um you know what was it 2015 when they first did the creatures outfit so seeing the band in creatures era outfits doing plaster caster in electric concert you know pretty cool yeah, cool stuff. <laughs> um, Lonnie, straight back to you for that. Um, they actually played it for the first time in 14 on the cruise. And I remember that because right after 14 on the cruise, they went and played a couple shows in Vegas. And they kept it in the set list for that. And right after, or no, 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 no. I take it back. Right after the cruise, they went to, or maybe right after the cruise, they went to, they went to Vegas. And I had tickets for Vegas, and I was really hoping they'd keep Plaster Caster in the set list for Vegas, because I really, really like Plaster Caster. And they did not. They played Parasite in its place in Vegas. Or maybe the first night even they played Plaster Caster in Vegas. Something like Maybe not. Really shaking us. And you were at the first night in Vegas. Yeah, I was there. And I, I didn't even remember 2014 it being played off the top of my head. So... Uh, Wasn't it in 2014 it was played? Because no, I had hopes going out there that they were going to play. They did the show in Mexico City. Plastercaster was still there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. then they did the cruise. Let's see, I'm on you know the new site, kissconcerthistory.com. Thanks for giving me a setup take, for a plug. You're taking a left turn here all of a sudden in the middle of the show. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, you're right. It was done on the cruise, and so, then it was dropped for the... Uh, dropped the before... Version before Vegas. I, I was really hoping they played in Vegas because, don't get me wrong, I like Parasite. Parasite's a great song and it's really fun live, but I, 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 I'd seen it before, you know what I mean? So I was hoping I'd get to see him do Plaster Caster because I've never seen him do Plaster Caster. And I was a little let down that they didn't do it. And I still go back to, you know, I saw him Friday and Saturday night in Vegas. You know, you could have dropped Parasite on Saturday night for Plaster Caster just to appease nerds like me that I get one different song. But anyway, I really, that being said, I really like the song. I have it fourth on my list, just like it appears in our group list. Um, great song, fun song, catchy song. Um, my wife hates it. Because uh, I told her one day what it was about. So that's absolutely disgusting. <laughs> you asked. So... I, lo I love it. It's, it's great. And like I said, I was disappointed. I didn't get to hear it live. I like it so much. So it's, it's way up there for me. Yeah, I would have loved to have had them drop it in the sets in, on the cruise. But no. <laughs> you would have liked to hear a lot of things on the cruise you didn't get to hear, though, Julian. But let's not open That's up true. that wound. <laughs> Thank you for rubbing salt in that wound, Lonnie. Mark, Plaster Caster. Uh, um, Plaster Caster was one of those songs that, that for a long time I never really, you know, thought much of. Um, before, when I got to the point where I would take the record off before Then She Kissed Me, there was a period of time where I would take it off before Plaster Caster even came on. Um, but what ended up happening was the MTV Unplugged, as we mentioned. And uh, the moment that that song got played on there, kind of realized at that point how good the song actually really is. You know, because I've always said, too, that I agree that when a song is stripped down to its bare bones like that, and if it's catchy, then it's a good song so um you know my my ranking of this song has gone you know up considerably from what it was before i mean i have it six but there was a time where it would have been probably as low as eight or maybe even nine i didn't like it that much but uh i, I really i really like it a lot more now it's really grown on me and it's a very catchy song ken yeah this one the first time i heard it i 
I love it. the first time I heard the album. I, I love this song. Um, the way the the bass comes in, you know, it's just a thumping bass at the beginning, and then the guitar riff comes in, then the drum, steady drum, and then it kick in more of a drum, and uh, it, it's just a a cool song. I didn't know what the heck they were talking about when I first heard it. Though, it's like what the heck, plastic? Guy? And then he said, in, in, "Injector." Wait, it wasn't gonna do. It stick a needle in her? No, it's something else. Oh yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, and, yeah. yeah. Same, same here. I forgot. Yeah, that. Like, yeah, it's like so ten years old. I have no idea what I'm. I'm walking around singing plaster caster. I have no yeah, idea. They what didn't, I'm you know, back <laughs> then. Back then, and probably rightly so, Kiss didn't put their you know lyrics in their albums back then. Um, because some of those lyrics, you know, like, oh, 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 wait a minute. Oh, I know what they're talking about. But uh, it, I just always loved it. And I had That's why I had number three on my list. It's number three. And I just think it's a, it's always been one of my favorite songs off the album. And it's a great Gene song. Just a great Gene song. So good one. All right. So we're into the top three here. And it's pretty obvious, you know, when you're doing an album like this, which ones are going to be at the top. So I'm going to just do the recap of uh, all the other ones in order in 10th place. Then she kissed me ninth tomorrow and tonight eighth uh, almost human seventh hooligan sixth got love for sale fifth Christine 16 fourth plastic caster and in third on 32 points shock me. And I actually had this the highest. This is my could very easily have been my favorite song on this album, were it not for the one I finally went with, because I was debating this most of the day in my head, going, which one, which one? And, you know, this really was a totally owning a recording. I want to hear the demo of this as well. I, I think it was Mark who was saying earlier that he heard that Eddie Kramer was spending more time on Ace and Peter on this album. Uh, well, listening to Peter's demo of Hooligan, it's not that different than what it actually ended up with um, as on the album, unlike apparently Baby Driver, which was substantially different before Kiss got their hands on it, according to Peter. Um, so I would love to hear how this song was in Ace's demo, uh, if there is one, just to compare. Great song, great vocal, great everything. Um, it's... <coughs> Ace's, you know, first real moment that uh, stands out on an album as a complete package in terms of performance, writing, execution, pr perfect production for it, and the band is just delivering 100% on this song. Ken, back to you for Shock Me. Yeah, I think uh, it was a great start for, for Ace, uh, for his first vocal, obviously. Um, um, I think I didn't like it at the beginning, uh, and again, over time, I did grow to really like it a lot. Uh, you know, he's used that solo uh, uh, as a lead into his main guitar solo for you know Live Two or the Love Gun Tour and, and that sort of thing. Um, and you know, the other thing I want to point out is Peter's drumming um, is still. I was really listening to it on this whole album, and especially this one. He does, you know, some syncopation stuff that he never really does <laughs> on any Kiss album. But his drumming on this album is top notch. He's still doing it, and uh, I gotta give him props for that because somewhere then after that, or after the live two tour or whatever, that's when things or drugs or whatever took over, and you know, the, the skills and diminished and all that stuff but he was still going pretty darn good uh the drumming is top notch this ace song is a great song um great riff i think ace maybe what it was good he got shocked because then it, it gave him these <laughs> gave him this song and 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 maybe it did maybe it did it sparked to say it sparked <laughs> other songs for like a solo album and stuff like that i mean uh you know, who knows what it did to him, you know, when he passed out and got all those, that voltage pumping through him. It might have made him super songwriting human or something, space ace <laughs> stuff. So anyway, uh, a great song. That's why it's number three on my list or two on my list, uh, somewhere up there. Uh, number four on your list, actually. Well, close. <laughs> it's, it's, it's way up there. Yeah. It is it's up there. It's, it's, it's good, though. Lonnie, it's shock a, me. Um, talking about Peter's drumming, um, it's one of the more famous, talking about 
people always have the debate a lot of times on the FAQ about oh, best drum intro. You know, people say King of the Mountain, and Rock and Roll Night is a famous drum intro. Shock Me has a very famous drum intro and a very great drum intro. And I always liked it when you know they introduce a song and Ace would go Shock Me, hit it, Peter. You know, and and Peter would start that famous drum intro. It's a great, it's number three on my list. And the only reason it's number three on my list is because, I mean, you know, the other two songs that are going to be one and two on my list. So it's fantastic. The guitar solo is incredible. I mean, to sit here and sing Shock Me's praises would be like sitting here singing, you know, Detroit Rock City's praises. I mean, it's, it's, it's a classic Kiss song. And you know, there's a reason why Kiss still does it even without Ace Frehley in the band because it's a great Kiss song. So, and it's a it's been a sta- it's a, been a staple in their set since '96 when Ace came back. Even with Ace not in the band, it's so good. So, you know, it's Ace's debut singing. There's so many great things about it. So it's it's number three on my list. Yeah, and that was one of the songs I did get on the cruise. <laughs> Still a little burnt. Still a little burnt. Yeah. <laughs> when Ace is in the building. Still, when in the don't, building, think, that don't think that's, that's the even, best thing. That's, like a, that's a little twist. That's a little twist of the knife. I, I think, already, they already got you, and they just twisted a little bit. Poor, poor Ace should have gotten the message right then and there with uh, them doing Shock Me. That yeah, it, it was really, uh, really, Ace, you thought it was happening? Well, Shock Me. Uh, Mark, <laughs> your thoughts on this song? Well, what I was saying earlier about Eddie working on those guys' material, I meant more sonically than like song arranging wise i mean because i can tell when you listen to this song particularly i mean listen to that rhythm guitar sound that they have on that it's really like in your face and really crunchy like when he hits that that bent f sharp that he does that there it's really hefty sounding more heftier than anything else on that record as far as that guitar sound i mean they really went to town with ace on that song i think and uh it's just well written i mean the guitar solo is one of his more signature solos. I know that uh, every time I've talked to people who love Kiss and are guitar players, the first thing that they say is that they, the solo that they always wanted to learn right off the bat was Shock Me. It's either that one or like Rocket Rider, the two ones that they always want to learn on guitar. And with good reason, because it's a, it probably has every single Ace really trick and licking the book in that solo so it, it it's fantastic he, he did a great job on it um and for a first vocal great job i mean you know he, he did a really good job on the song and it, there's a reason why it's a classic i mean it it just says ace really all over it like when you listen to it, it has his attitude it has his best guitar playing on it so i mean hats off to ace i mean i have it number three it's i it's a song that's always kind of sat with me really well as a guitar player and as a songwriter. I think he did a great job. Yep, did a great job on it. And, you know, going back to Eddie Kramer, and that's the difference between a, a, a super engineer and a producer. Yeah. And that yeah. really is the difference between what Eddie Kramer captures. When you listen to every single, de- I think every song apart from Then She Kissed Me, there's a demo out there for, and there's not that much difference in terms of arrangement, as you rightly noted in uh, mm. the point that you were making. It's just sonically developed, and the nuances are you know, seasoned in the right places, so each one of those songs is as powerful as it needs to be. I mean, Gene's stuff on the Vols, the stuff that was released in demo form on the deluxe edition, the you know paul stuff that circulated and same with um peters for years you know they're Mm -hmm. all the same songs they are just songs that were made better in the recording and didn't lose that edge if anything they gained from eddie's expertise in capturing kiss so perfectly so very good point thanks for clarifying your thoughts on that mark all right we're into second place now and these top two there's only a point separating them could have swung either way on them in number two on 37 points love gun um Again, from the moment I heard that song, it's been an all-time favorite. It is my number one pick, and uh, I'm the only one who put it number one. It's you three. You guys had the same picks on six of the songs on this album today. I was going to say, uh, I was gonna say a lot of these. You, I, I'm, the, I'm totally the outlier. You're the outlier. In, in terms of mine. <laughs> so um, I've loved this song. I love it live. Um, 
you know, I I don't even mind that it's basically a rip off of Led Zeppelin ripping off. You know, <laughs> Paul would have heard a lot of that when listening to Cream or Zeppelin, and um, what what was his name? Albert King as well did the Hunter, mm-hmm. which of right. course is where some of the lyrics come from. But they make it their own song, just as much as Led Zeppelin made that blue stuff that they lifted into their own, you know, very identifiable material by putting their own mm-hmm. stamp on it. So great song to this day i don't think i get tired of it um not radio friendly as we mentioned when we we're talking about the singles but who cares it's in concert it's a core part of the catalog and uh my number one pick and our number two pick mark back to you for love Gun. yeah I, I have this number two obviously and uh i really love this song ever since i heard it i thought it was a standout song um it's also a song that i've enjoyed not only listening to and watching them play live um, and many of the bands that I was involved in, or even if I went to like, you know, jam nights here around in Toronto and stuff like that, uh, Love Gun would be a song that frequently I would play in my bands or uh, jam nights or stuff like that. And uh, I even dared once sing it on stage, which was unbelievably hilarious if you ask me, uh, because I tried to do all the hand gestures and the, you know, all that stuff. So it looked pretty comical but i really i really love the song it's it's great uh again another really cool a solo and i mean not overly complicated but just that lick that it's so perfect for the song it just stands out like you know it's a real standout moment i i think that he is right when he says that this is probably his best written song that he ever wrote and it's i know paul said that he, he loves this song to this day still and uh you know it's it's a great song i think that he you know got on the right side of the bed when he wrote wrote it that day and uh the demo of this is also really good as well i thought uh, that he did at electric lady sounds great it is a great song and again i think that eddie kramer just gave it that little extra razzmatazz sonically that it needed to make it perfect yeah, poured some sonic caffeine on those demos. Lonnie, your thoughts on Love Gun? Fantastic. Fan, absolutely fantastic. I mean, staple Kiss song. The absolute love the guitar, you know, the da 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 It's just so cool, and it always resonated with me from the very first time I heard it, um, when I had it on audio cassette as a kid. I love when they play it live. I love the version on, on the album. It's, it's classic kiss song. It's absolutely classic kiss song. And in the fact that and then and then the lyrics too. I mean, it's just t- classic kiss lyrics. You pulled the trigger of my love gun. You know, it's like that that movie, um, is it what is it? Is it role models? And like that song's about Paul Stanley's dick, he's telling the kid. I mean it is it, it, it is. It's just great. It's it's total it's like kissing it. It's like, it's like a time. If you want to, if you want to describe, if you want, you could, there's certain songs that you could say, this is kiss. And love gun is one of those songs because Paul Stanley singing, it has a great beat. It has heavy guitars and it's about sex. I mean, it's kiss in a nutshell. It really is. And the only reason it's number two is because I like, I still love just that much more <laughs> today, today. Anyway, right. Exactly. Ken, final thoughts on love gun. Yeah. Love gun. Great song. There's a reason it's always in the set list. I mean, forever. Um, it's just a great song. Um, the I don't know who came up with it. I don't know if it was Peter or someone else about the the drum. You know, the machine gun drum part in you know in the song that goes goes on throughout it. Um, but it's just a fantastic little touches like that. And the background vocals are, are great in that in that song um, by the band. So there's there's a, there's a instance where they could have used those kind of vocals in tomorrow and tonight instead of the female vocals maybe. Um, but uh, great song. There's a reason it's number first song on side two of a vinyl. Like in the other song, you know, I stole your love is on the first song on the first side. So just just a great song i mean it's again like lonnie said you, you, i don't get tired of it i don't get tired of it good song and with the near perfect score which is of course 40 
And uh, this KISS FAQ panel's top song off Love Gun is, of course, I Stole Your Love. 38 points. That's about as close to perfection for our panel as any score, any song can score. So I love this song. It, my third pick, but again, those top three, you could pretty much swap them around on any day. What's your favorite song on Love Gun, Julian? It'll be one of those three, guaranteed. Um, I will, I, I, in fact, I don't even think I've heard this one live in concert. And it's one that I really oh, wow. would like to <laughs> hear live, yeah. you know, from kind of the more um, the more kind of prominent side of the catalog, because you can't call it a deep cut, but it's one that's not represented enough live uh, throughout right. the shows, which is just shows how tough it is for Kiss to pick any set regardless and make anyone happy. I think I enjoy Hot in the Shade bootlegs because they open with it uh, <laughs> particularly. So great song. Uh, Ken, back to you for... I stole your love. Yeah, it's a song that, in my opinion, should be in the set list. And I would love for them to throw it in on this, the next leg of the U.S. You know, tour. It's just throw a bone out there. And I, I know they have to take something out. But, man, if they if they threw that in there, uh, to me, I, that's an audience pleaser. Like I said, uh, like you were talking about um, with Hot in the Shade, um, when that when they kicked off with that, it was like, holy cow, this is fantastic, yeah, you know. And I think I only, I seen it live probably a couple other times, right? Um, and uh, but man, uh, I don't know why it hasn't been in the set list like other ones. I don't know what it is why they don't do it. Um, but it was number one on my list. Always been a great song, great riff. Sure, it, the riff again, like Love Gun, was taken. From I think uh, maybe a Deep Purple or whatever uh, song I don't know, it was Burn or one of those, um, and uh, but hey, they made it their own and it, it works great. So love it, Mark. Since you're listening to Deep Purple in your head right now, uh, what are your thoughts on I Still Your Love? <laughs> I can see you processing um, there for a minute. You're like, which song? Which song? You're playing in some of the the riffs in your head. <laughs> Um, I, I really like this song. To me, this represents a, a near absolutely perfect Kiss song. I mean, it has everything. It has great singing. It has great drumming in it. It has great bass playing, great singing. And I mean, you, and you even get a double guitar solo where you have Paul Stanley taking the first part of the solo and Ace Frehley taking the second half of the solo. So what more could you possibly want in a song? And it's probably one of the best opening songs that they've put on an album for sure. I mean, I still mm. put King of the Mountain as my favorite, but this is like right up there, like with it, you know, it's a fantastic opening song. And, you know, I agree with you guys too. I mean, why this hasn't been played more lately? I mean, it's, it's anybody's guess and it could, it should be an, an opening track. I mean, you know, it's, it, it's, it was, it was written to be an opener. So why don't they don't capitalize and use it? I mean, who knows why, but it's a great song and it's always been my favorite song off this record. All right, Lonnie, I believe it's you with the final thoughts before we let you get back to your headache. <laughs> I, uh, I've always loved, I still love it's for, on the first time I heard it on my cassette one as a kid. And I got to hear him play it live once. It was on the cruise that I went on. Sorry, Julian. And the crowd started, and it wasn't in the set list, and the crowd started chanting. <laughs> like in between songs, the crowd started chanting, I stole your love. I stole your love. And they played it. It was one of the more spontaneous things, you know, about about the cruise. And it, it, and it was and, and it was fantastic. It, it wasn't rehearsed. They weren't planning on doing it because I – Uh oh. I don't hear it, Julian. Yeah, I'm muted, so sorry. Uh, we, lo we lost Lonnie, but since he was talking about the cruise, that's what he gets. Um, <laughs> that was on purpose. Yeah, and it, it, it was one of those things that probably was so unrehearsed that a select group of people received little notes under their cabin doors uh, with a request for them to start chanting, I Still Your Love, at that exact spot in the cruise. <laughs> hey, you're back. No, he's frozen again. He just... He, he looked like he was going to be back. Yeah, so 
I guess the technical issues popping up for both Mark and for Lonnie, because Mark, you uh, did go all Canadian there for uh, part of it when you were talking. We will wrap it up. Uh, you know, final really? thoughts on the Love Gun album is uh, it's a great album. Again, it's very tough to you know have to put one of these songs in a lower position than the others, but uh, that's just how it goes. So I think we can all be happy with "I Still Your Love" as our panel's pick as a favorite song. You know, Love Gun did well for the band. You know, 1.2 million copies shipped by December 77, uh, up to just under 2 million by June 79. It sold 250,000 in the sound scan era, so it's well over double platinum. Um, who knows how many it shifted in the, in the 80s as well, so very popular album. Again, as we mentioned, everyone loves the packaging on it. But, you know, out there, how? what are your favorite songs on the album? How would you rank these from least favorite to favorite on the album you know what is your top pick if anything does it uh kind of it's probably going to be one of those three that we mentioned would be my guess and of course we didn't even talk about the first appearance of the ebo on a kiss recording so mm -hmm. you know on, on all the ways we've looked at it today singles our track order preferences and whatnot uh share yours with us where if you happen to listen to this uh nice mark Wherever you happen to listen to this episode on iTunes, leave us a review on YouTube. Click subscribe so you get alerts when we put up new videos. You actually bought that? Or was that a gift? Oh, it was a gift to myself. Oh, okay. Well, that, that's as legit. And that's what it looks like. Ebo. Hmm. Cool. All right. Well, thank you all for joining me today. And thank you all for listening to us. And we hope to see you again soon. Bye for now. Thank you for spending time listening to the KISS FAQ podcast today. All sales are final, there are no refunds. If you'd like, look us up on Facebook or come over to the KISS FAQ message board and discuss the topic we've broadcast today. Don't forget to rate us on iTunes, Spreaker, or wherever you've listened to the show. We hope you'll join us again.